Homer. Fun, fun stuff. Uh, you can be forgiven if you jump in and you get a little uh, uh, delirious. It's tough to acclimate. Um, it is very ancient. Um, so finding the ways that it makes sense is a challenge. The The traditions of storytelling that we have grown used to don't necessarily always apply with Homer. His sense of time tends to be a little bit unfamiliar to us. His sense of a focused story is a little bit obscure sometimes. Um, and it's uh, he is dealing with a context that is completely alien to the modern world. Almost. Um, it has been said that picking up Homer for the first time is a little like starting to watch a Mexican telenovela. The characters are weird. There are a whole lot of them. They all have wild backstories, and you have no idea what's going on. So you just jump in and you follow along. And sooner or later, things start, you know, making sense or having some familiarity. And you, you stumble around in the dark until you can find something that you can grab onto. And once you do, that's a great feeling because then you have, OK, this makes sense to me. I can cling to this rock and try and figure out what else is going on. But you need that sense of stability. And that's true in pretty much everything in life. Um, hello. With Homer and the Greeks in general, we are dealing with, as we have seen in the past, um, a rich and inordinately complex um, religious tradition. Uh, polytheistic, which is a Greek word. Uh, poly meaning many, thea meaning gods. Lots of gods. Gods, 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 and then some more gods. Um, it is a little Byzantine to jump into and figure your way around, but it's important to remember that Homer was not writing this for you, necessarily. Homer, if he existed at all, and I don't really care if he did, uh, was writing this for a fairly specific audience in the area we now know as Greece. Greece did not really exist. It was a loose tribal confederation. But everybody there would have some basic understanding of their cultural heritage. Everybody there would know who the major gods were. Uh, many of them had been adopted from other traditions. There are remarkable parallels between uh, the Babylonian gods, the Egyptian gods, these other great civilization centers um, of the time had some remarkable parallels going on here. And sometimes the Greeks just, you know, outright stole. Everybody did. Eh, you know, who's going to hold you to that? There's no copyright back then. Understanding the basics of the family tree of their context for the gods is uh, significant. So the major players. Cronus is an old god. I believe his title is actually a titan, uh, who gives birth to uh, Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, and Hades. A couple others we don't care about, but these are the big ones. Uh, Cronus, interestingly enough, became king of the gods, as he was by overthrowing his own father, Uranus, 
We're going to pronounce it like that to keep from giggling. Hello. So, Cronus, the child of Uranus, overthrows his father to become king of the gods. It's grisly, it's bloody, enough said. Cronus then, uh, like all, uh, like all monarchs in history who achieve their throne through violent means, become a little paranoid about their own children doing the same. It's hard to trust that it could never happen to you when in fact you did it to someone else. Um, Zeus ends up overthrowing Cronus, killing him in a particularly grisly fashion that I encourage everybody to Google because it's a really, you know, horrific story. Zeus, Hera, Poseidon, Hades. Zeus is king of the gods, nominally, but he is also basically also, well, he is also the sky king. He is known for having a thunderbolt as his weapon of choice. Hera uh, is wife and sister combined. Uh, you know, it agrees. Um, she has charge over, uh, she is the goddess of, what is she, like the hearth, um, of marriage, of traditional family structures like that. Her powers are a little less clear, but her access to power is largely through Zeus. She has some powers of her own, but her magic power is, uh, you know, getting her husband to do stuff. Again, uh, I'm not going to go near the sexism that is rampant in this characterization. The Greeks. Yeah, that's all I'm going to go there. Uh, Poseidon is the king of the sea, or the god of the sea, the ocean, whatever. He is generally known as, uh, or his most common epithet, the term that you see next to his name a lot, is Earthshaker, or some variant of that, meaning he causes earthquakes, because the ocean pounds the shore, and supposedly that creates earthquakes. Eh, you know, the, the science on that is a little shaky, I'll admit. Hades is the god of the underworld. Uh, he gets to lord it over the dead and come up with stuff for them to do. Not the most interesting realm, but he really doesn't pop up that much in what we're going uh, over. Uh, they are all um, particularly Zeus, I would argue, they are all uh, extraordinarily um, horny creatures. They have a lot of kids. Uh, Significantly, Zeus and Hera only have one kid. Ares, the god of war, the one nobody likes. Read into that what you will. Zeus has many other kids. The main ones, Athena, Apollo, Artemis, Aphrodite. Apollo and Artemis are twins. Twins! I have twins. <sighs> Aphrodite, goddess of <laughs> love and beauty. Ares, god of war. Hermes is the messenger god. Uh, he makes some notable appearances in Homer. Uh, generally, you guessed it, delivering messages from his father. Uh, and he's generally kind of a jerk in the way he does it, so you know. Living off daddy's coattails. Um, this power structure has an awful lot of... Uh, personality bumping into one another and a obvious tradition of betrayal. Think again about Cronus Uranus, Zeus Cronus, and then all of the little machinations that they are all doing 
to one another. They are all fighting with one another. They are all jealous of one another's powers, particularly Zeus's. Zeus can be a bit of a jerk too. But there's an awful lot of um, dissension in this. Yes? Just so I understand the hierarchy. So the only tie we would control with the Hera is the Ares. Yeah. Okay. Everybody else? Uh, Zeus like to play the field. You know, monogamy, monogamy. Who really cares? Um, Athena was fun. Uh, the legends of her birth were a little bit um, confused. Uh, Zeus, I believe, swallowed her mother, Metis, the goddess of wisdom, or something like that. And uh, Athena then popped out of his forehead. You know, Zeus gave birth to his own child out of his mind. Eh, interesting. Go crazy with that. Uh, they all have complicated backstories, like I said, and you can have a lot of fun learning those stories. But you don't need to know them for that. The important point is um, they are... Uh, they are a soap opera. They are a soap opera family. They are constantly backstabbing one another, scheming against one another, resenting one another, and stirring up trouble for humans just to piss one another off. A couple of incidences of that. Zeus! Where my notes for this one go? This one gets even hairier. Uh, Zeus um, has an affair, gives birth to Tantalus, a human, who gives birth to someone named Pelops. And when you see the word Peloponnesian War, that's because it's all coming from his name. Um, Pelops has two sons, Atreus and Thyestes. Of course, they are kings. These two rebel against the, uh, the royal house because they want to overthrow the royal house and set themselves up as kings, and they are exiled because, well, you know, it's all in the family overthrowing your uh, your father, your grandfather, whatever. Um, and then, of course, they go into exile. They set up in a little town called Mycenae. And they proceed to build a great kingdom. Of course, I am saying this in the plural they. And what does the plural they suggest? When you come to power, they is an uncomfortable word. Oh. Is it because they end up fighting over who becomes king? They end up fighting over who becomes king, and so they start to resent one another. And um, it gets a little heated. <laughs> Atreus and Thyestes go to war, in a sense. Um, <laughs> Thyestes has a couple of kids. Atreus invites a couple of the sons over. You know, hey, I want to talk about you know, what's going on between me and your dad, no hard feelings, you know, I just want want you to know, I'm trying to make it up with them, and, you know, we're family, we should all get along. Um, and, you know, that's a nice message to hear, and, 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 and then Atreus killed them both. Killed them both, chopped them up, invited Thyestes over for dinner, and guess what the menu was? Thyestes ate his own kids. 
That itself has another analog in the earlier generations, but we're not going there. Um, Atreus feeds Thyestes' kids to him. Thyestes takes this uh, not well, and so he goes and decides, I have to get back at Atreus. So he has, uh, he, he takes one of his daughters, his sons were the ones who were eaten, he takes one of his daughters, rapes her, and she produces a guy named Aegisthus, because he had been told by a prophet that if he did this, if he raped his daughter, she would produce a son, they would name him Aegisthus, and he would then go and kill Atreus. No, he would then go and kill uh, Agamemnon. Sorry. Actually, no, Atreus, you're right. I am right. It's very difficult to keep straight. So, that plays out. Atreus, in the meantime, has had two sons, Agamemnon and Menelaus. They are the two uh, primary figures in the uh, Trojan War. They go out, and it's really quite sweet. Uh, they go out and they marry sisters. Uh, Clytemnestra and Agamemnon get hitched, and so does Menelaus and Helen. Yes, you can figure, like, you know, lots of double dates. It's kind of cute. Two brothers, two sisters. It's adorable. Of course, in the Greek world, nothing is adorable for long. Um, <sighs> Helen is Helen of Troy. She, uh, she is the prize of a uh, beauty contest among the major goddesses between uh, Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. <coughs> this guy named Paris, who was just a shepherd from Troy at the time, was selected to choose the most beautiful goddess. And of course, uh, being goddesses, that's all they care about. They have divine power, but their beauty is their only concern. Um, again, eh, a little sexist, a little bit. <laughs> What's that? He's got some problems. Paris is his own issue. Uh, Paris, it turns out, was a shepherd, but he soon discovers that he's actually the son of the king of Troy, Priam, and he gets swept up into the Trojan War sort of on that level as well. But the initial thing was he couldn't decide which one of these three goddesses to choose, so the goddesses stepped in and offered him bribes. Athena is the goddess of wisdom, so she went to Paris and said, I'll make you smart. You'll be renowned as the, the biggest genius in all of Greece. Yeah, he didn't care. <laughs> he goes to Hera. Hera is uh, more of a political figure. She is a, uh, her powers are uh, built around political power essentially, her ability to influence, Zeus being the most striking example. So she goes to Paris and says, I'll make you powerful. Eh, eh, who doesn't like power? Make things happen, move her, shake her, come on. And still he's like, yeah. Aphrodite goes to him and says, I will give you the most beautiful woman in Greece. Boom! Sold American. He takes that up. He's a guy. He doesn't really care about being smart. He really doesn't care about power. Those are all just pretexts to the final goal, which is, of course, meeting girls. So, he chooses Aphrodite. Hera and Athena become implacably opposed to the entire Trojan nature, nation. And Paris 
skedaddles back over to Troy, discovers that he's son of the king, life is good for Paris these days, and Agamemnon and Menelaus, Menelaus being the husband who is left, they raise an army to go get her. That's the Trojan War. Well, that's the beginning. Ten years of fighting, essentially trench warfare. Um, ten years. In that time, um, Clytemnestra, you know, is sitting around. Uh, my husband sailed far away because his brother's an idiot who can't keep his wife at home, and now I'm just sitting here. What am I to do? She's sitting around just taking care of Agamemnon's kids, notably Orestes the son, Electra and Iphigenia. Well, Electra is the daughter. They have other kids too. Again, we don't care about them. Iphigenia goes with her dad. <sighs> Iphigenia has a distinction in the history of the Trojan War because at its very beginning, before it really begins, the Greek ships are sailing over to Troy. It's not a far sail, but you know, you got to go somewhere. And they run into bad weather. Bad weather is always considered a sign that the gods are displeased in some way. Perhaps you got Poseidon pissed off, you don't know. So they're hanging out on this island called Aulis and just waiting for the storm to pass, and it's just not passing. The weather is just keeping them locked down, and they're like, you know, we're just sitting here. We can't get over there to fight. We want to fight. They were really impatient to get there, perhaps not knowing that it was going to be a 10-year slug, and you got to uh, pace yourself. Agamemnon consults a prophet. What can I do? And the answer, of course, is that in order to appease the gods in some way and clear up the weather for good sailing so that you can go begin the war on an auspicious note, you need to kill your daughter. Sacrifice what you love, and the gods will be appeased. Which Agamemnon does, and somehow, I don't know how, they didn't have modern communications, word gets back to Clytemnestra that, eh, well, you know, he killed your daughter. So now she's abandoned at home, not much of a life or an identity of her own outside of the family, of course, and her daughter, I think the firstborn, uh, killed. She doesn't much get along with her other daughter for other reasons, but we won't go into that. Um, she's sitting around, she's bored, she's resentful. Hostility, strife, eris. One of my favorite Greek words. And so, who comes to visit? Our old buddy of Jesus. Hey, just driving by. Thought I'd drop in and say howdy. Um, and you know, lonely wife, husband's out of town. You know where that's going. <laughs> He's already killed Atreus. You can see the uh, Inter-family violence rearing up again, always trying to get back at the house of Atreus, the line of Atreus, for the horror inflicted upon his family. So, Aegisthus and Clytemnestra wait until the war is over. Well, they can, it's not like they can bring it to a hasty end. The war is over. Agamemnon comes home. Honey, I'm home! Big welcome. Uh, not covered necessarily in Homer. 
You'll see it in, what is it, Sophocles? I'm blanking on that. It, his story gets told quite a bit. That's why I'm dwelling on it here. Uh, uh, his welcome did not go, did not go very well. He arrives home expecting, you know, eh, I've been away for 10 years, fighting for the glory of Greece, and I'm coming back victorious. Uh, I brought uh, lots of slave girls that I've been raping for a while, and, you know, I'm going to have them around the house so I can continue to do so. And, you know, it's really for you, hon, because it, it, it takes some of the pressure off you. Yeah, and they're good. They'll, they'll do some housework, too. Including one of the best ones is the daughter of the king that we killed back in Troy. A little hottie named Cassandra, who has this weird habit of just declaring these prophecies, but we don't take her seriously. But you know, there was this, this, this curse on her by the gods that she would always speak truth in her prophecies, but no one would ever take her seriously. Because gods are ironic like that, and they love to screw with you. But of course, she keeps saying that I'm going to die as I come home. I don't take that seriously. No, I'm home. Everybody loves me, right? They kill Agamemnon. Bloody, bloody mess. And here, this goes to the heart of a very key topic in Greece that I cannot stress enough. Xenia. Hospitality. Treating your guests well. Um, he wasn't really a guest, but he was coming home. Was that hospitality? To be killed in your own home as you come back? I don't know. But, of course, you can make a very good argument that hospitality itself was violated way back here with this ill-fated dinner. Uh, you know, a meal, sitting down to a meal, is almost the definition of domestic hospitality. Come on in. You look hungry. Can I get you something? They violate these laws of civilization, these codes of conduct among decent people, these morals. And thus they trip off cycles of violence and destruction that just keep going. As long as somebody feels slighted or cheated or taken advantage of, that hostility that Eris will boil up, will goad them into another act of violence, another horrific, horrific violation of morality. And just repeat it over and over again. Now, it doesn't take much to see this pattern of um, interlocking relationships on the divine end and the human end. They are all awful. They are all choked through with um, scheming, with uh, cruelty, with pettiness, with vindictiveness, with negativity of all kinds. You can say that, well, the humans are just taking their cues from the gods, but that doesn't really absolve them of responsibility for their actions. Maybe the gods are just jerks. Do we have to follow them? There's nothing that says that any of these people, they hold great power in the heavens, but there's nothing that says that you absolutely have to control them. 
they themselves are bound by fate. They cannot violate fate. There is something written in the great book of reality for them that they cannot change. Zeus himself will often say, uh, you know, I'd love to change things. That's fate. What the gods do around the edges of that, however, is try and slow down fate or accelerate fate, often at great cross purposes, often perpetuating these same cycles of violence and devastation. The gods take sides. In the Trojan War, you get gods siding with one another. In the aftermath of the Trojan War, you get gods siding with one another against other gods, advocating for certain heroes, frustrating other gods in their advocating for their heroes. It is uh, it's a fairly close parallel to see, I think, um, relatively small scale tribal relations, political squabbling on an ancient uh, task where a society, Greece is not small and it's fairly spread out. There are a lot of islands in it, which will make some contact fractious, but you can see a, an emphasis on the difficulty of getting along. The perils of diplomacy and a consciousness that beneath every smile there might be a hidden agenda. There is great violence simmering underneath the surface because there are horrors out there that are not resolved easily. People will hold grudges. And that is a political reality to this day. So this poem, these poems, the Homeric works, um, are a way of processing this essential conundrum of a civilization that is no longer just a bunch of isolated pockets of people but it's a tribal society that is slowly interweaving and finding that we cannot go any further with just harboring resentments. We need to find a way to get along. These poems are not moralistic in that way. They're not saying, you know, why can't we all just go get along? They're posing the questions and relying on us to come up with some notion of how we can try because the goal itself is always naturally beyond our reach. Nobody will ever get along 100%. But how do we work towards that goal? It is not that difficult to understand if you think of it in those terms. It's not that abstract. It's not that ancient. It's not that foreign. It is ripped from the headlines, for better or for worse.